Welcome to the final part of the Cyberpunk Trilogy. Twins. Dead twins. Conjoined twins. Kojima's love child. My childhood home. Hobbits. Well, I saw this woman at the shops who owned a couple of these and she kept referring to them as children. But I'm not an idiot. I'm pretty sure they're called hobbits. Stand up comedy. I assure you that we'll do our best to regain your trust. <laughs> Creepy shop dummies. Culture. Scrotum cats. Welcome to Cyberpunk 2077. A game created by geniuses and published by jackasses. Spoiler warning. This video contains extensive plot and story spoilers. Welcome back for what is hopefully the final part of this epic, early, overlong and rambling trilogy of videos. Lord of the Shills, Return of the Scumlord. Thank you all for your stoic and patient endurance. I mean that literally. Thank you for sticking with this video series. When I stated that this entire phenomenon was a huge and complicated issue, well that certainly has proven to be the case. Events are still unfolding on the ground, to the point where I had to add an entire addendum to this video because of all the new recent shenanigans unfolding in real time. Nonsense apology videos, insider informants, they even earned themselves another class action lawsuit. Well done. I warned multiple times that the whole of the video game industry had painted a giant bullseye on CDPR's back because they take a stand against microtransactions in their single player games. So it is kind of a shame that instead of practicing caution, they decided to jump out of the trench and run drunkenly around no man's land whilst waving a flare above their heads. If they had intended to make themselves an easy target, short of standing in front of an actual target on a shooting range, they could not have done a better job. But I digress. So what's my overall take on Cyberpunk 2077? There is definitely a bit of a cult at the moment chanting the following mantra. CD Projekt Red did bad things, therefore you must say bad things about this game. I'm actually getting some pushback from people for singing the praises of this game. I'm not buying into that. CDPR executives were shitbags. Seriously, some of them have behaved like complete wankers. And this certainly ain't the game that was promised. But I'm reviewing this game. The game we got. I have shouted loud about all the crimes and misdemeanours perpetrated by CDPR but I'm not going to shit on this game as some form of retribution against the executive management. There is also an adage from the film world that applies profoundly to this game. People will watch a movie shot on a toy camera if the story is compelling. This is literally true, and sadly all too applicable in this case, because I did thoroughly enjoy the shit out of this game despite its flaws and problems. But damn, there are some significant problems. This is the double-edged sword of the game. The world and story is superb, but the underlying mechanics seem to be, well, broken. As you play longer and start to theorycraft, you start to notice. Little uncomfortable realities start to creep in. Those two epic 30% crit mods don't seem to stack. Or if they do, that means the UI might be totally broken and not calculating figures and not calculating values correctly at all. You stack epic armour mods on all your gear, but things don't feel right. 
Then you go to the forums and realise that the mitigation calculations might be balked. Every car or gas tank explosion one-shots you on any level on any difficulty with any level of mitigation. All my gear and stats look pretty, but is this shit actually working under the hood? I loved my experience with this game, but I am starting to strongly suspect that a lot of the core game mechanics are not working as described. This game might have Division 1 levels of fucked up DPS, mitigation and perk activation degrees of fuckery hidden in the circuitry, and I will frankly be impressed if they ever manage to fix all of the game mechanics. People's impressions of the game are going to be incredibly varied across different players. If you just hammered through the main questline, you will frankly think the game is a lot of set-piece quests and cutscenes, akin to a rather lavish, staple single-player campaign in a first-person online shooter. A player who splits their time between all the activities, explores and reads the messages, shards and listens in on conversations, is going to experience a more fleshed-out world. The story, questlines and characters are brilliantly written, voice acted and animated. If you're not affected by at least a couple of the quests, then frankly, you have a blacker soul than me. Takamura's stoicism, Jackie's friendship, Wakako chewing you out Japan style for screwing up a job, Misty seeming too fragile for the world she inhabits, Victor Vector really coming across like he cares about you, Pan Am's incredible uh, qualities. Johnny Silverhand for being a delightful cocktail of pure rock and roller, idealist and professional asshole. These are all memorable three-dimensional and unique characters carefully brought to life. Thus far I have not skipped a single conversation or cutscene. Christ, there was a bit in one particular conversation where I commented on how our plan was fucking ridiculous and the previously stoic character actually smirked and had a glint in their eye in response. It was literally the first time I've ever seen them come close to smiling. The game is constructed thoughtfully and with authenticity when it really counts. I passed a girl singing her rendition of a musical song to a friend, sitting on a squat couch on a roof. Listening to the dialogue, she was singing a song about the corporate wars. Chilling and most likely prophetic. Every culture has songs, hymns and ballads about the history that the previous generations have faced, and some of these ballads persist and survive for so long people forget what they were really about. It frankly worried me that in a hundred years time kids will be singing nursery rhymes and hymns about how the corporations took over, like that's heritage, like that's normal. Especially because it may well happen. I mention this in the context of the game, but this made me think about it in real life. There is a critical point here about video game design, story and background lore. I have often seen desperately hardworking writers and creative minds try and instantly populate video games with story, lore and narrative from scratch. But it doesn't really work very often, does it? A common complaint of video game writers is that they get dragged in way too late in the development process and instructed to pretty much splash some story paint on it. When you sit a bunch of writers down several years into development, with the launch a year or less away, and just demand they write a masterpiece story for your game, well that's ridiculous. Sometimes they pull it off, but not often. You can't realistically go up to a bunch of video game story writers and say, bang us up a masterpiece, you got four months. Sometimes magic happens, but even when it does, that magic usually evolved into lore and emotional story content over several iterations and sequels of the game. Fallout, Halo, Gears of War, Warcraft, very few nail it 9am day one, like Homeworld did. Sadly, the most typical result is some kind of sub-sci-fi level of fan fiction writing where it's obvious everything has been reverse engineered to fit the practically finished game. Cyberpunk story and game world has instant gravity and depth because it's based on lore from an RPG that came out in 1988. The lore in this game was fully formed, evolved and developed over decades. Long before anyone ever considered making a video game set in this universe. This was video games in 1988. So effectively, Cyberpunk 2077 is a literal adaptation 
and naturally brings along some of the baggage associated with that. But mostly it brings along 30 years of background story, a fully fleshed out game world and a fuck ton of reference material for the writers to work with. In most games I struggle to read the in-game stuff and read the quest story nonsense because honestly most of the time you can smell the stink of shit that writers just got forced to make up in order to give an illusion of story and context. In this game I read all the in-game shards, texts and text, I watched the TV stations and listened to the radio, because it all provided coherent and consistent information fleshing out the localised story within the game and taught me about the wider cyberpunk universe. That's the kind of shit that only works this well when you have a 30 year old game universe and you hire the creator to work on the game development. The dynamic between V and Johnny Silverhand was very interesting. At times he's like an angry parrot on your shoulder, at other times he's like an antagonistic sidekick, joined at the hip. It's not a heavily featured dynamic but without giving too much away he makes some very timely smirkworthy comments. There's a lot of criticism about whether this game qualifies as an RPG. I don't even know if I'm qualified to talk about this. I like RPGs like Fallout and Kingdom Come Deliverance and I read up on definitions and terms and Cyberpunk 2077 certainly qualifies as an RPG technically. However, members of the Church of RPG perhaps correctly point out that your RP capabilities are largely confined to your character creation and perk choices, so technically this is a looter, shooter or action game. Personally, I think it's an RPG light, action, looter, shooterish game. But fuck me, people will no doubt be arguing about this for the next decade. Claims that you can't impact the world enough are substantially true. You don't have a story arc that significantly alters the city itself. You can't side with a faction and steer a faction based conclusion to the story. You can't drop a fucking nuke on the problem like Fallout 4. There are no reputation systems with the factions, your relationship and prestige doesn't really evolve or change with fixers, lots of the world is static and stable despite your actions. And the parts that are not immediately reset once you travel one kilometre and come back. The ending of the story changes for the player character only, not really for the game environment. Night City pretty much ticks along doing what Night City is always doing and what it has always done. Most of the player's actions and choices are largely confined to quest outcomes, player outcomes, loot rewards and your character build. And I guess to some degree I can see why this might piss off a lot of people who expect this kind of world building and destiny shaping in their RPGs. But at the same time, a prime narrative in the game and the story is the whole theme of Night City being a giant omnipresent beast that dispassionately chews up and spits out its occupants like a huge dispassionate meat grinder. Everyone in Night City to some degree is a bit player at the mercy of forces larger than themselves. You might not be able to shape your own destiny, but at least you can be responsible for your dignity and how you face your fate. Would it really make coherent sense if V skipped into Night City from bumfuck nowhere town like Dick fucking Whittington and by doing a few crafty quests ended up becoming crowned king of the fucking city. I don't think so. I don't think that would really make sense. Jackie's dream was making the big time and it just got him killed. V isn't bigger than the gangs. He ain't bigger than Arasaka and he certainly ain't bigger than Night City. If it was possible to be an agent of change that would reshape the entire city, then Johnny Silverhand and Rogue would have done it 50 years earlier. Right at the start of the game you find out that Johnny Silverhand let off a nuclear fucking warhead right under the middle of Night City. And that didn't change shit. So what are people expecting? V magically finds a cure, transplants Johnny's AI into a little robot R2-D2 droid and becomes his sidekick he ends up becoming mayor of Night City, ending poverty, crime and injustice and then they all skip off into the sunset, singing Follow the Yellow Brick Road. I do think that there are critical RPG elements missing and I do think V's actions should have a localised impact on the city like 
driving out certain gangs from specific areas or something like that. But the world changing mechanics also have to make sense within the story. Don't get me wrong, there are consequences for your actions, make no fucking mistake about that, but they tend to be confined directly to you and don't really impact the world around you much, if at all. Fail to spec into tech or body and there will be routes, access points and loot caches you will never be able to access. Do a quest specifically well and you might get an insanely nice free car. Do a quest especially badly and the person might die. Fuck, there is a quest where literally someone's life is dependent on your levels of empathy. However, most of the time it's not like the person you save is someone you're going to run into all of the time and positive outcomes tend to be loot oriented. The game also generally gives you the impression, at least, that your speech choices in conversations don't matter, despite evidence to the contrary. Frequently this is definitely the case, however now I've played the game longer I know that at least some of the time the way you interact within the game does have huge implications for you, which you won't be aware of at the time. Maybe it's a sign of maturity that the game often delays the results of your actions so you don't realise there is a cause and effect going on. That dude you decided to beat up, you won't ever realise that he's one of the best vendors in the game, until your next playthrough or you watch a YouTube video. You save a life and get a free car at one point if you persuade someone not to do something, but the outcome is determined by conversations you've had over the previous few days. At the moment of truth, saying the correct thing only works if you said the correct thing on several prior conversations too. If you decide to do one quest before another, you might cause the other quest giver to die. In another questline I discovered that my desired outcome was already balked because I said some stupid shit weeks earlier. Sometimes the rewards for your noble actions get delivered many days or weeks later and without Google searches or second playthroughs you will be none the wiser. It's not like Fallout where there's usually an immediate and obvious feedback mechanism during a speech check. Say the wrong thing and Mr Grumpy turns hostile. Now I only found out about a lot of these outcomes because I looked them up when researching the video and frankly I can say from first hand experience the game doesn't often directly let you know when you fucked up or worked smart, so if people get the impression that what you say don't matter, well that might be true a lot of the time but at least some of the time it makes huge differences to the outcomes. Like I said, maybe it's a sign of maturity that the game doesn't give immediate telegraphed feedback, like having the NPC light up like a fucking slot machine jackpot when you give the right answer. This sense of powerlessness and lack of agency is probably amplified by the plot being about how a big brutal city makes victims out of its occupants, how corporations makes pawns out of us all and the fact that so many of the NPCs are fucking bots. I actually stopped going up to random NPCs because I got fed up with one line fuck offs and eventually assumed they were all bots. This is not technically true, but statistically it's such long odds any of them will respond. Ultimately it doesn't feel like the world is a nicer or nastier place based on your actions and perhaps slightly more sadly, doesn't often feel like the player character is a nicer or nastier person based on your actions, apart from your own conscience of course. You can drive around in your conspicuous sports car wearing bright gold moon boots relentlessly killing Tiger Claw gang members, but the Tiger Claws are no more or less likely to attack you. They will not send hit squads after you. You can run people over for lols, as long as you only do it in small batches and drive away quick. The warrant never needs to be paid off, the cops never kick your door in at home. There's no morality metric, reputation metric, police file on you, nor any means to engage with your kindness or cruelty and this leaves a noticeable void at the heart of the RPG mechanics. Why are there no reputation systems or hostility systems? Perhaps I missed something, but is everyone so nihilistic that they just do or don't attack me and nothing I do matters? Maybe this is some kind of deep hidden stat and I don't understand, 
but I never really understood any relationship between my actions and who would attack me. I could theorycraft this till the cows come home or just speculate that they probably didn't have time to implement the system. Just like all the other stuff they didn't get around to implement despite clear signs that they intended to. There is a subway system with stations, but they never implemented the system for players riding on the subway trains. There is a system in game for players to be put in the back of police cars, but that didn't get finished either. No doubt there are a fuck ton of other things too. I would note that the trope that all the endings are pretty much the same simply is not the case. There are some parameters confining the potential outcomes, but let's just say that they range between hopeful and fucking desolate. And some of these outcomes are based on whether you have or have not advanced certain quest lines. The artificial intelligence is a real mixed bag. In certain encounters and defended locations, the guys flank, charge, patrol, and god forbid, actually do stuff more imaginative than one of those little robot vacuum cleaners. But don't rely on it. Sometimes the NPCs are like tin pot soldiers. But strangely in other fights, I've actually had dudes sneak around behind me and shoot me in the arse. In the open world, some of the AI is literally simple Boolean logic. This is a next gen game, but some of the AI could run on a ZX81. And no, that is not an exaggeration. Park a car in the wrong place and the city's transport infrastructure collapses. Drive too near the pavement and pedestrians shit the bed. Fire a gun in town and all the NPCs do a mass slav squat. Stare at a cop, they wig out. But carjack right under their fucking noses and it's Dunkin fucking donuts time. It makes no sense at all. On top of all this potential immersion breaking stuff, there are the little developer tricks they have pulled, probably as hotfixes, to correct random problems. Try occasionally looking over your shoulder quickly a few times an hour. That traffic jam, sometimes that shit magically vanishes when you look away and then look back again. Sometimes the NPCs walking behind you despawn and respawn when you look over your shoulder. They are totally generating the world in line of sight priority, far too aggressively. I mean, this game has serious issues with object permanency. Sometimes it feels like only the game world directly in your field of vision is real, and everything out of sight is being magically disintegrated and repopulated depending on which way you're facing. Some of the quests are literally brilliant. I'm not just talking about the main quest line here, but the side quests. Some of them are deep, funny, and or entertaining. I shit you not, this is some top shelf writing here. It's rare to experience this many amazingly well written quests in one game. Everyone talks about that particular quest with the priest in Kingdom Come Deliverance. Well, I'm not going to make any wild claims here, but I certainly think a few of the quest lines here are at least in the same league as that. Some of you might remember me from my Division 1 coverage. Remember how I said that the Alexis Kwan quest was excellent and poetic? It was a particularly haunting yet beautiful moment in the game. Cyberpunk 2077 has quests like that. Not one, but many. I'm talking deep, emotionally impacting quests if you take the time to think about the implications that is. The in-game systems are a mess, the in-game economy is a mess, so much of this game is a fucking mess. But the story world they built is superb, if you can just slow down for a few minutes and experience it. You can patch game mechanics, not stories. Night City is full of stories if you can just take a second to experience the world. One of the most compelling aspects of the game is the subtle consequences of your actions. Or more precisely, your fuck ups. I fucked up a stealth mission and ended up having to gun down all the guards and workers. Let's just say that when looting their personal effects, I found the odd item on their bodies that made me feel really quite guilty about what I'd done. On another occasion, I fucked it when talking to someone and instead of defusing a situation, I was then forced to assassinate an honest, principled person I had no desire to kill. That sucked. One time a group became hostile to me, so I just got my gun out and killed the fucking job lot of them. Then I discovered that they were all security guards. 
I was trespassing and I had effectively assassinated the entire night shift, stolen their skiddies and sandwiches just because I bumblefucked into their turf like a dumbass. Just because someone is hostile to you does not give you the god given right to destroy them. You play how you want to play but personally, I was trying to at least be an honourable rogue but I still ended up getting my hands dirty a few times in ways that didn't feel great. Despite accusations that this game is trampling on diversity, being transphobic, sexist and generally hurting people's fee-fees by simply failing to be a safe space, fourth wave feminist, coffee shop simulator, the game is just about as diverse as it could possibly be. I played as a lady with a penis. My best mate Jackie was Hispanic. I ended up with a Japanese bestie, surviving in a city where affiliation is primarily structured around faction, class, wealth and meritocratic ability. At no point in this game did anyone give a shit about race, gender or sexuality. Because it's 2077 and people have other more important shit to worry about, like surviving. So if any virtue signalling numbskull ever claims that this game is transphobic, tell them that during one quest, my transgender character ended up helping a transgender NPC character and at one point talking with them by a drinks machine with a transgender advert on it. I defy any video game to do better than that shit right there. The gun fuckery is sadly real. Don't get me wrong, I love the gunplay, the meaty weapons and the combat. They have also, thankfully, avoided the shotgun fallacy and most of the shotguns have pretty realistic ranges. But there was the usual nonsense. Multiplicative damage modifiers, which were the bane of the Division 1. Basically that means that every bonus gets multiplied by the next bonus and then the next one and then the next one and you end up with insanely sick high nonsensical high damage. You can't put holographic optics on sniper rifles because reasons. I'm struggling to understand what the buck is going on half the time but it certainly appears like high powered pistols are vastly more powerful than anything coming out of a long barrel, with the one possible exception of the most powerful sniper rifles. I have a pistol that can do 65% of the damage of a sniper rifle, which is a little bit silly. This said, the gun porn is delicious. The models, animations and sounds are as much if not more than we can expect, especially considering that nearly all of the guns are fictional designs. They also synergize with perks to a phenomenal degree and the gun perks, like chemical or fire damage, compound this to make it a min maxes paradise. Sure, the smart guns are piss weak, but who cares when you can hide behind a trash can, shit your britches and fire 20 shots in the air and then watch them zip around in an arc, back down to earth and drill into your enemy's fucking skull. Sure, the full auto guns are piss weak, but who cares when you have a percentage chance per bullet to debuff your target, maybe set them on fire or stun them. I would note however that there is a bit of a black hole where the semi-automatic rifle should be. I hate to use the term assault rifle because it's frankly got political baggage these days but by using that term people will know what I mean. The game seems to go through pistols, shotguns, subguns, PDWs and then kind of leap entirely over intermediate and rifle calibre SLRs and suddenly get to sniper rifles. I kept trying to find some weapon that was rifle calibre with the form somewhere between an M4 and an M14. I wanted something that was single shot but reasonably powerful but not a sniper rifle. And right there was a huge black hole in the weapon design. Battle rifles. There is something for future DLC content. Some long guns that shoot slower but hit harder and don't have a bloody sniper scope on them. The guns remind me a bit of Wasteland 3. They are fun, interesting, you can make them work and enjoy using them, but damn, they should have hired a gunsmith. Who the fuck would lug around a 12 pound sniper rifle doing 2k per shot when there is a pistol raining down 1k bombs that you can tuck into your fucking waistband? Any comparisons with Fallout 76, whilst being humorous, are entirely disingenuous. 
Fallout 76 was a video game with a train wreck launch, which at the time turned out not to have any substantive amount of actual video game under the hood. Fallout 76 was basically the bare bones of the Fallout 4 game engine, with some NPC World of Warcraft spawn zones added, and a few text documents scattered around. It was a cunt farm of nothingness. The dry rice cracker of video game content, which also happened to launch entirely and functionally broken across all platforms. Think about that. A broken game with no fucking actual game content. It took years for them to drag it into a semi-functional condition. Barely. Imagine ordering something from Amazon and you only get a box. And the fucking box has a hole in it. Cyberpunk 2077 might have had a clusterfuck launch and promotional cycle, but it's vastly better performing than Fallout 76. And more importantly, under the chaos and lies, Cyberpunk has a phenomenal and enormous game. Both games had a fair launch, but only one had something decent under the bonnet. And make no mistake, Keanu fucking Reeves brought his A game. The mocap and voice acting was generally brilliant throughout the game, with many actors delivering spot on, genuinely sympathetic performances, in no small part because of the decent writing and story. But I honestly thought Silverhand was an entirely fleshed out three dimensional character. He was Elvis, Sid Vicious, and Che Guevara all rolled into one. They say it's better to burn out than to fade away. Well, Silverhand got to do both. He died young in a blaze of glory and gets to come back and analyse his life's successes and failures in retrospect. It's like a fucked up version of It's a Wonderful Life, only it starts 50 years after George Bailey kills himself, and he gets to come back to see how the world pretty much turned into the shithole future he was desperately trying to avoid. Bleak, I know. God knows I'm not fangirling for Keanu Reeves. Anyone who watches my channel will be acutely aware that I called him out for mugging that tramp and eating those puppies. But I honestly think this performance might be his Fight Club moment in video games. Love him or hate him, Brad Pitt pretty much cemented his place in serious cinema history for a spot on performance in the film adaptation of Chuck Palahniuk's novel Fight Club. The jury might still be out regarding whether or not Brad Pitt is a good actor. Fuck, some people contest the notion that he even is an actor. Everything gonna be iry. But he was perfect for Fight Club. Look, I take the piss out of Keanu fucking Reeves all the time, but I think he nailed it in Cyberpunk 2077. I'm not going to say he stole the show, because Pan Am, Misty, Vic, Judy, Takamura and the other characters were blinding too, but he did good fucking work and I think it was excellent casting. Seriously, it was spot on casting. They needed someone who could pull off lovable asshole without it descending into unintentional comedy. Imagine if they'd cast Johnny Depp. Robert Downey Jr. or Matt Damon. They're all decent actors, but the game would have probably come across like a 1980s comedy buddy movie. This very easily could have been farcical. If they'd cast the wrong person, it could have easily transformed the atmosphere of the game into There's a guy in my head. You might not like Keanu Reeves, but imagine this game with Ben Affleck, Steve Buscemi, or Danny fucking DeVito. Keanu fucking Reeves did fine work, and he pitched it just right. Lovable asshole, I tell thee. This war's a people's war against a system that spiraled out of our control. It's a war against the fucking forces of entropy. Understand? Sony pulling the game from the store must have a political or financial dimension as yet to be identified. Come on, let's act like grown-ups here. Nobody really believes Sony pulled this game from the store just to protect the consumers and because of poor performance, right? I mean, fucking seriously. 
anyone taking Sony's benevolent statements at face value regarding caring for gamers and product performance must be blowing fucking bubbles or smoking the same shady home-baked crack that my mum does. Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. Bless them, I love those games, but buggy as fuck for years. The Division 2. Entire world tiers missing at launch. Console players locked out of progression for months because of a bug. Teleporting NPCs and unfinished terrain and modelling. Anthem. Just, just fucking Anthem. Battlefield 4. The online servers didn't work for months after launch, breaking up clans and ripping off the players who had taken out rental on game servers. Skyrim. Filled the cash on PS3 every hour, so you needed to restart the game every 60 minutes. Fallout 76. No Man's Sky. The Avengers. I don't claim to know what Sony's motivations are, but let's be pragmatic and go with the evidence. They ain't protecting the customer. They are showboating for some reason, and I would love to know what that reason is. Because Sony doesn't automatically pull games from the store that never end up working properly and always run like shit. But for some reason they jumped on this game at launch like they were looking for an excuse. Something is going on with Sony here and I really would love to know what it is. I keep hearing the same soundbite which is clearly propagating from some online source because it's practically being quoted verbatim all over the internet. Cyberpunk 2077 must run like shit because Sony pulled it from the store and they didn't even do that with Fallout 76. I think this statement is misleading and frankly a little dishonest. I can state categorically that the state of Fallout 76 at launch was catastrophic and vastly worse than Cyberpunk 2077. It's not even in the same league. It also had barely any content and that's if the game ran long enough for you to actually do anything. Sony's decision to pull a game from the store is not some kind of reliable technical standard of quality or scientific metric. It's clearly not, because games far worse than Cyberpunk were never pulled. This is a business, commercial and PR decision. So basing the quality of the game on Sony's decision to pull it makes no logical sense. That's like claiming someone must be guilty of a crime by sole virtue of the fact they have been sentenced and thrown in jail without a trial. Jumping from accusation to punishment, skipping over the important bit in the middle, the fair hearing. We know Fallout 76 was vastly worse than Cyberpunk, that's a fact. Just because Cyberpunk got pulled doesn't create the logical conditions where it must be there for in a worse state, in contradiction to the obvious and overwhelming factual evidence to the contrary. This is someone's hot take, it's rhetoric, it's logically nonsensical and alludes to a state of affairs in a way that misrepresents the facts. Look, Sony pulled this game for reasons we don't know but we do know it's not because of quality control, because if that was the case, they would be pulling several AAA titles every year. And let us not forget, Sony is a video game publisher too, in competition with CDPR, and these guys already have an antagonistic relationship. Remember that Sony is in the middle of a huge content purge and moral drive to censor all sexual and mature content off their platforms. And everyone was wondering how the fuck they were going to deal with Cyberpunk 2077, possibly the most sexually overt and blatantly sexualized video game of the year. It's got dicks. It's got dicks on chicks. It's got dicks in shops. Dicks on your character. It's got breast physics, peephole bras, sex scenes. However, CDPR were not prepared to censor the game. Sony knew if they refused to host the game on the PlayStation Store, they would probably lose the next-gen console war. It was a Mexican standoff. CDPR were not going to budge and censor their game, and Sony knew if they enforced their censorship rules and banned the game in advance of the PS5 release, 
millions of people would buy next-gen Xboxes instead. Well, Sony got to have their cake and eat it. They got all the PlayStation 5 sales from having Cyberpunk 2077 in the store. And then used the launch problems as the excuse to censor the game. Sony has shown in 2020 that they will use any dirty tactic in the book, right down to abusing DMCA laws to censor the internet. I strongly suspect that this was their long game. Hold off until after the launch of the next-gen console and then cook up a reason to ban Cyberpunk 2077 later and issue refunds. Because they simply could not afford to exclude the most hyped video game of the fucking year from the PS5. That is certainly the most logical reason why Sony has suddenly decided to ban a game from its store which runs better than many other games at launch but is incidentally the only video game launching recently with constant all-pervading in-your-face sexual content in complete violation of its censorship code from a publisher that has refused to censor the game's content. Take a step back and think this one through. The whole incident is shady. The excuses Sony has given don't make sense. Sony does not apply this standard to any other games. I think this is what happened. This was a deliberate play by Sony. Sorry guys, but I think Sony just misled and betrayed its own player base. Again. Or perhaps it's best to say this is how Sony dicked over its players this month. Allegedly. I think the best evidence that my theory is absolutely correct and on the money is if Cyberpunk 2077 only comes back to the PlayStation Store censored for its adult content because Sony leverages the ban to force them to sanitise the game or if the game never comes back at all even after it's fully patched up and running perfectly. If Sony magically reinstates the game when it's running a bit better without any content removed or censorship in play then that is probably evidence that Sony were up to some other unrelated industry bullshit and shenanigans. Let's wait and see. I keep hearing comments along the lines of CDPR are the new Bethesda and that is kind of funny right? But when I hear comments like Cyberpunk 76, well that's not so funny. It worries me that people forget so quickly just how fucked in the arse that non-game Fallout 76 was at launch. Sure, it's better now and I know people who like it two years later, but fuck, anyone seriously comparing this to a cut and shut game engine asset flip seriously needs some fucking oxygen. I think without doubt that CDPR or CD Projekt Red are converging on AAA publishers regarding tactics. I don't think they're as bad as them yet, but there is no denying they seem to have started using similar tactics. I shit you not, it's like someone from Ubisoft is running the marketing department and the new CDPR slogan is, lying is fun. The bizarre thing is, if CDPR had been 100% honest about cut content and unfinished stuff and all the nonsense, they were probably one of the few publishers that could have gotten away with it. They should have said things like, fuck it, sorry, we had to trim down the character customization to save time, we'll spam it up later. Oh bad, the subway system will be finished in a later patch. We fucked up, sorry, but the police wanted an arrest system will be in a free DLC later this year. They lied, at a time when they would have been respected for their honesty. Now we have to assume everything they ever say might be a lie. And it saddens me because I'm not convinced things won't just continue to get worse. It worries me that they might have crossed the marketing bullshit Rubicon or something more sinister is going on here. The first real evidential sign that Bethesda was preparing for a full sell-off to a major player was when they tossed their reputation out of the cab and drove at breakneck speed towards short-term profit. No doubt to increase their sale value. After a decade of being industry darlings and nearly a decade of hyping Cyberpunk 2077, in the final moments as they were about to cross the finishing line, 
the executive management at CD Projekt Red tossed their company reputation out of the cab and drove directly for short term profit. Suddenly, CDPR has gone full Todd Howard. I don't know finance, I don't know business and I certainly don't have any contacts in the video game industry, but I spot patterns. Think about it. The signs with the Zenimax slash Bethesda sale to Microsoft were always there in plain sight. One minute they were the good guys who hated monetization. Next minute they were into monetization but kept saying that they were the good guys. They became obsessed with monetization and profit first but kept shining everyone on with bullshit press statements saying how nice they really were. Then they busted out Fallout Shelter, a greedy app with greedier loot boxes. Then they fucked Fallout 76 out of the door, monetized to the hilt. Then whilst everyone was scratching their heads wondering why Bethesda had thrown its own reputation under the fucking bus for fast short term profit, we all collectively went, ah, when Microsoft announced the acquisition was complete. They had traded reputation for short term profit to pump up the sale value. Well CD Projekt Red thus far has gone from hating monetization and loot boxes to loving that shit and bullshitting about it. Busted out a shitty card game app with greedy loot boxes. Fucked an unfinished game out of the door. They are making a fully monetized online cyberpunk game, no doubt with loot boxes, and thrown their reputation under the bus for fast profit. But all I'm going to say is CD Projekt Red are kind of starting to follow the same trajectory as Bethesda did just before they sold out. So I guess let's watch this space and see what happens. The cyberpunk shitstorm is still a Gale Force 10. I guess Razor Fist's warning about the horrific non-disclosure agreement should serve as official notice that maybe nice guy CDPR are now behaving like a fully fledged AAA publisher in their Ubisofted marketing department at least. Honestly, if they started hitting critical YouTube channels with DMCA strikes right now, it would not fucking surprise me. When you are allegedly making your reviewers sign a contract saying that they can't say anything negative about the game or show footage of bugs, well frankly that's not really a review is it? The apology video was a real piece of work and by work I mean nonsense. Marcin Iwinski, joint CEO, stood in front of the camera and faked his best attempt at the sort of face a teenage boy would make if they were just about to tell their dad that they had got their mum pregnant. It was a face of shame with maybe a little fear thrown in. Although after the Activision fake apology, I kept wondering if he was about to smirk. What exactly? The short version is this, he was super sorry for getting caught I guess. They never intended for anything like this to happen, even though they did it. No doubt puking out an unfinished game and getting busted for lying about it and actively concealing that, I'm sure was not his intended outcome. Then he claimed that the root cause of the problem was that they made things even harder for themselves by trying to make everything so epic and awesome for us. This is frankly the technological game development equivalent of playing the victim card. This is straight out of the compulsive liars handbook and I've seen people do it before many times. This is compulsive liar 101. Whenever they routinely fail to do the simple task that they promised to do, the excuse is that they tried to do the task in a more thorough and awesome way and over deliver, but it all went horribly wrong because of their ambition and attempt to please us because they tried to do too much. Positioning themselves as virtuous, noble and ultimately the victim in the whole situation. 
Obviously, after the second time they pull this shit, you see right through it, especially because you never hear them say, I had a simple thing to do, I didn't do it, it won't happen again, and I'll do that job right now, just like I promised. Then he went on to blame the quality assurance and testing teams for not noticing the issues with the game because it was all so complex. I'm sorry, but if you launch a game on a base last-gen console and it's fucked, there is no complexity there. There are zero degrees of complexity. It don't run. That's not a tiny detail that might slip past you. Game broke. Game, it broke. It not run. Don't blame the quality assurance department. That's just throwing people's careers under the bus to cover up the failings of the leadership. Then he went on to frame not being ready at launch as we were working on quality until the very last moment. This is pure fucking sophistry. But then came the fucking doozy, the cherry clagnut on the bullshit cake. I was incredulous. This is why we started sending console review keys on the 8th of December, which was later than we originally planned. This all happened while working from home with all the challenges resulting from the COVID-related restrictions. Resulting from the COVID-related restrictions. COVID-related restrictions. COVID-related restrictions. COVID ate my homework. Yes, he did it. He pulled his best sad face and blamed COVID. How supremely pathetic. And then just to double down on his shame, he pulled out a roadmap. So yeah, sadly, my previous suspicions have been confirmed. Cyberpunk 2077 is a live service launch and always was a live service game. It has roadmaps. It won't be fully patched on all platforms until some point before the end of the year, although dates were conveniently missing from the schematic. I am absolutely not joking when I say that I strongly suspect that some of Ubisoft's marketing staff have migrated over to CDPR, because I have seen all this kind of shit before whilst covering the Division franchise. Iwinski did not admit to or apologise for CDPR lying to shareholders about console performance, actively concealing the state of the game, embargoing footage to service this goal, or blatantly misrepresenting the game repeatedly over the last few years. Let's look at the most recent example of a publisher restricting footage and placing embargoes on footage prior to launch. The Last of Us 2. Well, they did that to deliberately hide information critical to making an informed purchase. They were trying to hide the fact that... And spoilers ahead. 3, 2, 1. The assumed protagonist was killed off at the start of the game. The game was now an anti-patriarchal identity politics car crash. And that they had spoofed trailer footage to trick people into thinking Joel was a central character in the game. Typically, publishers embargo footage because they are trying to hide bad stuff. This is now a pattern. CDPR misbehaves and betrays the trust of their fans. CDPR then issues some heartfelt statement about doing better. CDPR then misbehaves again. Rinse and fucking repeat. If this was one isolated incident, I could give them the benefit of the doubt. But it ain't. At this point, they certainly seem to think that they can mug people off and repeatedly get away with it by saying sorry and whinging on about the trust people place in them. Look, if you catch your wife flirting with her ex-boyfriend one time, well, shit happens. A sincere apology might suffice. But if you keep catching your missus in a dockside pub, fucking sailors in the toilet, a point may well come where you have to question her commitment to your relationship. Well, personally, I've seen CDPR fucking enough sailors in the toilets to start challenging their commitment to their loyal fans.
This is a tragic thing to have to say, but their non-apology and victimhood statement probably did more to make me suspicious of their executive management than the actual shady shit they've done. This non-apology video just showed me the following. They will not admit to the shit that they have done wrong. They will tell lies about the lies they are apparently sorry for. They will blame other people within their company for management failings. They will employ the rhetoric and tactics of compulsive liars to represent themselves as the victims in all of this. Seriously, they're kind of framing themselves like somehow none of this is their fault, but they're going to take responsibility for what happened anyway, because they're the good guys, right? I'm sorry, they did this. They need to own it. Look, video games are hard to make, I fucking get it. They were overambitious, and despite incredible work by their devs, they couldn't hit deadline. We all get that. They want to regain our trust. Fuck off, sunshine. That ship has sailed. When someone stands up and lies about their lies, and incidentally pulls out a roadmap, revealing that there are other lies they haven't told us about yet, well, that trust is permanently and irrevocably burned. CDPR have fucked it now. They are no longer trustworthy. Next time they pull this shit, and there will be a next time, next time their bullshit won't fly at all. There will be a Battlefield Vagina level shitstorm and fucking villager uprising. In addition to the god-awful non-apology video, Jason Schreier published an article in Bloomberg allegedly exposing the full failure of the production timeline. Jason Schreier is best described as the Dog the Bounty Hunter of video game journalism. Read into that what you will. He basically managed to round up every pissed off, angry and bitter CDPR employee and ex-employee who off the record catalogued a litany of failures. Crunch, mismanagement, completely impossible production schedules, a habit of resetting progress and having to start all over from scratch, and significantly, the E3 demo gameplay footage being faked. Oh yeah, and the senior management's habit of basically employing what can best be described as YOLO management attitudes. We'll figure it out as we go along. I'm sure the case is somewhat exaggerated because that's what you get when you primarily get opinions from the people angry enough to speak to the press. But it certainly seems that the reports are credible, albeit to some degree overstated. Naturally, the article has set off yet more fronts on this firestorm, especially regarding the faked game footage at the E3 demo. Well, first off, let's have a quick reality check regarding game reveals at video game events. Let's go to 21 kilotons fucking science lab and use some science and logic. Video game publishers release their games as early as is humanly possible so they can start earning sales money as early as they possibly can. That is why nearly all games release with bugs not fully tested and in many cases unfinished. Therefore, we can postulate that since publishers release games the very second they are finished or earlier sometimes, if a game is not yet released, it is because it is not fucking finished. Has anyone ever gone to a video game reveal and heard the publisher say, you're seeing the final product and it's totally finished? It releases in six months time because we just thought it would be funny to stick our thumbs up our asses for half a year and sit on a perfectly ready, complete, tested, serviceable product because lols. No. The second it's serviceable, it gets thrown out of the door. I hate to break it to you, and I actually know this for a fact. It is entirely not uncommon for video game reveals to be, to some degree, faked. It's just a case of how much fakery and fuckery is going on. With many games, they show you the only finished level, or they box off a little part of the map and let you play that 
because it's the only part of the map that's finished. And here is some empirical proof that publishers fake game demos all the damn time. The Division 2 had a gameplay demo at E3 in June 2018. The Division 2 launched in March 2019. I would fucking postulate that it is unlikely they were demoing the finished game at E3 considering that the game was not even finished. Ten months later, on fucking launch day, one of three entire world tiers was completely missing, which they worked on and released a month after launch. So the issue here is not about whether they faked it, it's about how badly they faked the demo. I would speculate that they probably got a 7 or an 8 out of 10 for fakery. They look pretty guilty. Just keep in mind that all the other publishers fake their demos too. So this is really a matter of degree, not guilt or innocence. The sum totality of these recent claims about production is this. Because of these surface similarities with other games that had troubled production, unrealistic launch expectations, and released in an unfinished state, plagued by bugs, a lot of commentators, even some I previously respected, have suddenly started spouting comments such as Cyberpunk 2077 is Anthem 2.0 Cyberpunk is another No Man's Sky To which I would cunningly retort Oh fuck off and grow up If Cyberpunk launched with no content, Anthem 2.0 might be a reasonable comparison if Night City turned out to be a procedurally generated world and not actually a finished design, No Man's Sky might be a reasonable comparison. But a troubled production does not mean you can compare this game to two of the most famous bargain bucket contentless fuck up games in existence. At least they were at launch. An SA-80 assault rifle and a cheap plastic stapler both have trouble with the feeding mechanism. Doesn't mean they're both equally useless as a weapon. These analogies are ridiculous. Anthem 2.0, what the actual fuck? Get a grip of those emotions, children. Stop lying on your belly, fist thumping the carpet and crying for fuck's sake. Anthem 2.0, fuck. I also keep hearing people say, this is one of the most disastrous launches ever. Is this actually true though? Or has it had the most disastrous reception ever? The game is quantifiably in better working order than most live service games and many AAA games. It's primarily a complete fuck up on base last gen consoles. If you ranked the worst releases in the last five years, Cyberpunk 2077 wouldn't make it into the top 10 list of worst games at launch. But somehow everyone is drinking the Kool-Aid and claiming the game is the biggest fucking catastrophe of the century. Fast and Furious Crossroads, Elder Scrolls Blades, Warcraft 3 Reforged. There's three from just 2020. Do I have to compile the whole list? The mis-selling argument is flying back and forth. The counter-narrative is that there was no technically cut content because it was never there in the game, therefore it wasn't technically cut. I'm not buying that one myself. I'm sure some of it was them running their mouths off about stuff that wasn't finished and finalised, that they thought was really cool and wanted in the game, and I agree with their explanation of what happened. I do, however, have an issue with them thinking this is acceptable anyway. I mean, that is precisely why publishers don't run their mouths off, right? You only promote shit that is actually finalised and going to be in the game. If you go public and tell your customers that X, Y and Z are features in your game and then it ain't there in the final product, discussing whether it was technically cut or not is mere fucking semantics. If they said certain cool shit was in the game and it turned out to be dropped in production, it doesn't matter how you verbalise or frame how that content that you promised would be there is no longer in the game. It's content that ain't in the game, so for now I am still referring to it as cut content. Personally I think that's more flattering than the literal precise truth, but saying 
content that CDPR bullshitted about to promote their game which is now missing from the final product is too much of a mouthful to keep repeating. The Nexus mod situation is also slightly disturbing. CDPR seems to be assuming that modders will fix lots of issues for them. I seem to remember Bethesda relied heavily on modders to fix their broken shit too and look how that turned out. Basically a giant army of hard working and noble modders did a load of legwork and heavy lifting for Bethesda because Bethesda was too lazy or cheap ass to do it themselves and they all got fuck all gratitude for it. In fact Bethesda basically dicked them over with their mod monetization program and tried to siphon money away from these guys. Sorry, but the parallels with pre-Microsoft sale Bethesda are starting to stack up. Whilst trying to distill what really is going on with this game in the simplest way, I basically came to the following conclusion about the game plan for the development and launch catastrophe. CDPR's arch fail tactics were this. The senior management spontaneously decided to make an overly ambitious open world game. The marketing department over promised and over hyped the product. The actual creative workers and developers were put in an almost impossible position where they were instructed to rustle up a masterpiece in an impossibly short timescale. They frankly did a fucking incredible job, but obviously could not achieve impossible targets. The senior management engaged in skullduggery and deception to conceal the fact the game wasn't ready. The end result was frankly an impressive and brilliant game that wasn't finished, wasn't what was promised, but was nevertheless a pretty amazing game. Absolute credit to the people who made this game, absolute shame on the executive management, utter embarrassment for the marketing department. The game has the makings of a masterpiece but it's just not fucking finished. And I'm talking all kinds of unfinished. Systems, mechanics and modelling elements have been entirely skipped over, omitted or exist in an incomplete state. I'm not talking about buggy, shoddy or bad. I'm talking missing. Some water mechanics are missing. Some crafting mechanics are missing. Promised content is missing. This game wasn't released before it was ready. Cyberpunk 2077 was released before it was fucking made. I think Cyberpunk has been a disaster on so many levels, but thanks to the ground level devs, creatives and artists doing stellar work, the end result is vastly greater than the sum of its individual fuck ups. I strongly recommend that anyone watch the movie Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse. It's a documentary about the trials and tribulations of the making of the movie Apocalypse Now. Everything went wrong on that film. One young star had a heart attack and could barely work. Another turned up hugely overweight and acted like a non-compliant bastard. The helicopters they were using kept getting called off the set to go and fight rebels. And it was all filmed in the middle of a fucking jungle. Yet despite the end product drifting from the original game plan, it did end up being a work of art. I'm just saying, don't automatically judge the end result based on the problems encountered on the production journey. Oh, and just in case someone from CDPR is watching this at their desk and hasn't been sacked for watching my channel yet, this game could really use a survival difficulty level on a par with Fallout or Kingdom Come Deliverance. The infrastructure is already entirely in place. You just need hydration levels, nutrition levels, sleep levels, higher enemy damage, much lower ammo amounts in loot, Kingdom Come Deliverance save mechanisms, significant injury from crashing in a car, more significant and specific injury mechanics, etc etc. A proper serious hardcore immersive mode for this game would be fucking golden and I don't think it would require much work. Well I guess it's time to wind this fucker up and let you all get back to your normal or abnormal lives. I have always said that the only thing I guarantee on my channel is my honest unfiltered opinion. Once again 
That promise has come back to bite me in the arse. Because I know the sensible and tactical thing to do is to hate on this game, but I can't. The CEO might be a lying clown, <coughs> or financial genius preparing for a sale. The marketing department might be smoking Drano and crushed diet pills. The launch might be an unmitigated disaster. Public opinion is currently siding against the game. The general consensus is that it's average at best. But I honestly think the underlying story, narrative and in principle game mechanics are fucking brilliant. We can discuss how the executive management should be punished another day, but I am not punishing the game itself for the crimes of the executive management. If you play the entire game, reveal all the backstory, read all the shards and pay attention, you end up with one of the best, most nihilistic stories in a video game. It does however worry me that I find myself thinking and saying some of the same shit about Cyberpunk that I did about The Division 1 in the early days. For those of you who don't know me, I loved that game despite its flaws, covered it extensively for years, tried to be optimistic and give the publisher the benefit of the doubt, and eventually realised it was exactly like dating a junkie supermodel. I started out thinking the Division franchise was a beautiful girlfriend with a bit of a heroin problem, and eventually had to accept the reality that it was a manipulative, dishonest, thieving junkie that just happened to be well fit with a cracking rack. I guess what I'm saying is that whilst I think it's critically important to recognise that despite all the fuckery, underneath this game is literally bordering on art. It's a fucking 50 quid masterpiece that will keep you occupied for hundreds of hours with a cracking story that was clearly created by people with skill who obviously sweated blood and tears to build this world. But we should never cross the line into making excuses for the publisher. I'm not saying we should forgive them because it's a great game. I'm saying it's a great game and we should at no point let the senior management off the hook for all of their fuckery. Personally, I think Cyberpunk 2077 is a victory of modern game development and a failure of modern game publishing. The game represents a huge convergence of creative talent, creative minds and coherent game design. The creative development, art design, story writing, music, acting and Mike Pondsmith's frankly brilliant game world somehow managed to coalesce into a coherent video game world. Everyone on the creative side of this game, especially the ground level developers, should feel rightly proud for what they have achieved here. I just think it's a bit sad that the publishing side of the company and the executive management don't seem competent enough to fuck a donkey in a barnyard if they had a bottle of whiskey, a packet of Viagra and the donkey was staked to the ground and feeling frisky. I also need to mention that a friend of mine, Zoo, pointed out that many of the same content creators and YouTubers who benefited from privileged early access and sneak peeks of Cyberpunk over the last year or so are precisely the same people capitalising on the poor launch. They were perfectly delighted to ride the roller coaster of insider access journalism on the way up and gleefully turned on CDPR as the roller coaster went back down. I guess there is a lesson to be learned here about doing business with influencers. I have repeatedly said that corporations, marketing departments and community managers are not your friends. It's business and they will turn on you in an instant if it benefits them. Well I guess it's turned out to be a double edged sword for CDPR's marketing department. The exact same guys who profiteered from promoting this game with access journalism are now profiteering from shitting on the game. Everyone should make sure to go back and look up some of those early access videos to remind yourself who was selling this game without even seeing the end product. They were all very happy to be paid to go over to Poland and act chummy with CDPR, but when the hot takes and the fast money was in feigning outrage and siding with the angry villagers, they whipped off their cyberpunk free merchandise, grabbed a pitchfork and joined the angry mob. You can't buy loyalty, you can only rent it, and I'm sure there are a few people in the marketing department right now who have scores to settle with certain influencers. What can I say? 
If you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. There was one moment late in the game during a particular quest, which I won't spoil, where you intimately experience the devastation that monolithic corporations can wreak on the poor and the disempowered. It was a legitimately powerful video game story moment, and I just couldn't help thinking about the parallels in real life. A lot of people invested a lot in this game, and the entire project has been ruined, in the short term at least, because of corporate greed and corporate betrayal. The players are secondary victims here. If the game runs on your system, you're probably enjoying the game. If not, you're going to get a refund. The people who got fucked are the people who spent years working on this. The developers, writers, and everyone else who put genuine creative input into it. They're the ones that got fucked. Even Keanu fucking Reeves got fucked. The real message here is not some soundbite like CDPR are just as bad as all the rest of the AAA developers. The real message is that it only took a few corrupt corpos at the top of the company to betray everyone that worked on this game, the players, and the company's own reputation. The precise fucking warnings you experience in the game are precisely what played out in real life. And that right there is poetic. Fucked up but poetic. If anyone pays 50 quid for this game and dismisses it as shite, well clearly they have higher expectations than me. Because let's face it, the competition right now mostly ain't up to much. This game might not be as promised, might not be the full RPG people were expecting, and the story might not press your buttons. But objectively, and in its own right, this game is fucking superb, and it's the most game with this level of writing and scope of game world, you're gonna get anytime soon for 50 bucks. So I'm going to nail my colours to the mast, for better or for worse. I think Cyberpunk 2077 is undoubtedly the best game I have played this year. It will stand the test of time. Some aspects of the game qualify as art in their own right. It is objectively close to being a masterpiece. And if CDPR finish the damn thing, complete the cut content, fix the broken mechanics, and release some sizeable quality DLC expansions, in 2029, YouTubers are going to be philosophizing about whether or not Cyberpunk 2077 is game of the decade, whilst conveniently pretending that they fucking loved it all along. Obviously, that is as long as we're not all living in a post-apocalyptical dystopian hellscape by the year 2029. Although for me personally, that would still be a win. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Bye.